probably the first labor union that is a labor union, the way you and I think of labor unions, is the American Federation of Labor. <clears throat> the AFL was established in 1886 as a response to some labor unrest, which we'll talk about shortly, <clears throat> but also in response to an increase in immigration. In the 1870s and 1880s, we saw a rapid increase in um, immigration into this country. Now, as we remember with supply and demand, if the supply of something goes up, the demand for it stays the same, its price will drop. The same is with labor. Supply was rapidly increasing, demand was staying the same, wages were dropping. And so the AFL was started basically to counteract <clears throat> that wage drop. <clears throat> the AFL actually began uh, as a way of workers to come together to try to get higher wages. And they pushed the point that AFL members all were good American citizens, they all spoke English, they all understood the American way of life. And so the AFL is, was established. Now the AFL is still around, um, and you may know it by a slightly different name, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, another labor union that we saw established in the early 1900s was the Industrial Workers of the World. This is the socialist, uh, this is the labor union arm of the socialist party. Um, it's still in existence today. I was able to find uh, membership numbers for 2016. They have about 3,500 members. <clears throat> they ran into a lot of difficulties uh, during the First World War um, by telling uh, workers not to join the army when the war hit. Um, first draft dodgers uh, telling their men to uh, burn their draft cards. <clears throat> no, that was not something that just happened in the 1960s. Um, but the um, IWW inevitably causes people to think of labor unions and socialists together. It's a strange link. Um, but it's, it's still there in some people's minds. Now, when we get to the Great Depression, strange things happen. Labor unions lose power because as unemployment rises, the unions cannot guarantee jobs. <clears throat> People are saying, why do I want to belong to a union if it can't guarantee me a job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when Roosevelt becomes president, he comes in with the idea that the government, very Keynesian, the government should intervene in the economy. The government should start providing social programs. The government should be providing unemployment compensation and social security and all these social programs that unions traditionally had provided their members. Now, the AFL was really a mix of both craft union and industrial unions. The old craft union people very much were nervous about the government providing these social programs. And so they were very much against the New Deal and what Roosevelt was trying to do. The industrial unions being younger, newer, they didn't have quite the uh, distrust of the government and the government coming in and providing these programs. So there was a real um, fight within the AFL, which finally um, caused the industrial workers to split off in uh, 1936, they split off and started their own union called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. Um, the AFL and the CIO would be separate organizations 
until 1956 when they merged back again and created the AFL-CIO um, as you and I uh, know it today. Now, why were we seeing so many labor unions being created um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Well, there was lots of labor unrest. There was one strike after another. Some of them were very violent and notable. Uh, we had a railroad strike in 1877, which completely shut down the rail system. We had uh, a series of nationwide strikes in 1886. Uh, those strikes were calling for an eight-hour workday, which to you and I uh, is nothing, but it was a real issue. Um, during this strike, there was a bombing in Haymarket Square, which I believe is in Chicago. Um, bomb went off, killed some people. Uh, never quite sure who set off the bomb, whether it was the labor unions or people who were against the labor unions. We can't tell. There was also a crucial strike in 1892 against the Homestead Steel Plant. Uh, this was a very important strike. It was against Andrew Carnegie's steel plant at Homestead. I think it's a real turning point in labor unions. If you have a chance, I embedded in the course a link to a video. Um, I labeled it the Homestead video. Um, but it's um, a link through YouTube to a series called The 10 Days That Changed America. Uh, it's about a 45-minute video. If you've got some time, it's really worth a look because it very much does show how this homestead strike um, changed the way workers think of their position in um, in American society and really truly worth worth your time to take a look at. Please do do that. Um, there's one more strike in 1894, the Pullman strike. It was a strike against the Pullman Rail Company. They used to make um, railroad cars. Um, these strikes, what kind of stands out is they were very disruptive to uh, the economy. Um, I wish we were in class. We would take a real take some time to to look at this, but we just don't have time with the lectures. Um, so take a look at that uh, homestead video, and hopefully you'll get a really good uh, feeling for how labor unions changed. Now, the public opinion about labor unions swings like a pendulum. It swings to the far extent of labor unions are incredibly necessary and we can't do without them. And then the la then it swings back to the other end in which we believe labor unions are harmful, they are uh, <clears throat> detrimental to our American way of life. And so it's, it's interesting, this change. What I want to now do is look at some legislation that gets bandied about when we talk about labor unions. Now, the first one we talk about is the Sherman Antitrust Act. Now, remember, the Sherman Antitrust Act had nothing to do with labor unions. It was passed in an attempt to regulate big business, to keep businesses from <clears throat> monopolizing a market. Interestingly, almost immediately upon the Sherman Antitrust Act being passed, businesses used it against labor unions. Remember the wording of the Sherman Antitrust Act. It is illegal for people to come together to restrict the free trade of a good. Now, if you think of labor as a good, 
Isn't that exactly what a union is doing? Restricting the free trade of labor. Interesting approach. It actually worked. <clears throat> Big businesses were able to go to court and say that labor unions were against the Sherman Antitrust Act <clears throat> and should be banned. In the 1890s, there were no laws making labor unions legal. The flip side of that, there were no laws making labor unions illegal either. Now, the Sherman Antitrust Act should never have been used against labor unions, but it was. It wouldn't be until the 1930s that we started seeing legislation that dealt specifically with labor unions. The first piece of legislation which dealt with labor unions was the Norris LaGuardia Act of 1932. <clears throat> Remember, 1932 is almost the depths of the Great Depression. Labor unions had no power. Workers had no power. Almost 25% of the labor force was unemployed. Workers <clears throat> were in bad trouble. And it's interesting that at this time, we get the law that gives workers the right to set up unions and to elect union representation. So it's with the Norris LaGuardia Act that labor unions are protected against being the Sherman Antitrust Act. <coughs> They're specifically given their power at this point. Now, there's another act that gets passed in the 1930s, and that's the Wagner Act. <coughs> the Wagner Act is extremely important because it put some teeth into the Norris LaGuardia Act. It specifically said that employers must bargain in good faith. We still hear that term today uh, <clears throat> when labor and management are having difficulties. By bargaining in good faith, we mean they, that when you come to the table to negotiate, you're trying to negotiate and you're trying to come to a solution. You're not just trying to stall, all right? Uh, the Wagner Act said it was also illegal for employers to try employers to try to stop union organization. And probably its most important aspect of the Wagner Act is that it sets up something called the National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board oversees actions of labor unions. It oversees their creation. It oversees their elections. It kind of gives labor unions um, some structure. What I find incredibly important <clears throat> that the two laws which give unions power, which give them structure, are passed at a time when labor unions had little if no power. What is interesting is that <clears throat> in the 1940s, the pendulum swings all the way to the other side, <clears throat> and we then get a piece of legislation which actually restricts labor unions. And that's what we're going to start our next lecture with. <clears throat>